Dr. Luigi Grattan, MD, is a specialist in family medicine and a clinical physician at the UCLA Center for Human Nutrition, studying obesity as a risk factor. He has written numerous articles on nutrition and obesity and has appeared on television speaking about anti-aging medicine, sports nutrition, and other medical topics. Dr. Grattan is the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Education at Herbalife International. His focus is ensuring that distributors around the world have a thorough understanding of all the products sold by Herbalife, their ingredients and benefits. The digestive or gastrointestinal systems may present certain conditions as a result of not having a healthy diet or adequate amounts of fiber in our diet. Here's what we can do to improve our digestive health. Although we hear about the importance of digestive health every day, very few people actually have a good understanding of the digestive system, how it works, and some conditions which can arise as a result of having poor digestive health. Let's start with a brief look at how our digestive system works. The mouth receives food into our body and reduces it in size by chewing and mixing with saliva secreted by the salivary glands. The tongue then pushes the food back down the alimentary canal and the food flows down the esophagus to the stomach. Once the food reaches the stomach, digestion begins. The stomach is primarily responsible for digestion of proteins and ionization of minerals and secretes various acids, hormones, and enzymes which break down the food into a solid mass, which is more easily digested. Now water and sugar are absorbed in the stomach and the majority of other nutrients are left to be absorbed in the small intestine. The small intestine receives the food from the stomach, as well as secretions from the pancreas, liver, and its own glands to complete the digestive process for all three basic food groups. Most of the absorption of nutrients occurs in the small intestine, which is 21 feet long and divided into three segments. The first is the duodenum, 10 to 12 inches. The duodenum primarily deals with absorption of minerals. The next is the jejunum. It's the middle portion, and it's about eight feet long. The jejunum is responsible for absorption of water, soluble vitamins, carbohydrates, and protein. Next is the ileum, the end portion, about 12 feet long. The ileum absorbs fat-soluble vitamins, fat, cholesterol, and bile salts. Now the villi, or the intestinal hairs in the small intestinal wall, are the primary structures through which absorption of nutrients occur. Eating toxic food, or trashy food, can cause a layer to accumulate over the villi, and this impedes the absorption of nutrients into the body. In addition, intestinal juice is produced by the glands of the small intestine itself which completes the digestion of proteins and carbohydrates. After the majority of nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine, the large intestine absorbs water. It also absorbs electrolytes and some of the final products of digestion in limited amounts. It also provides temporary storage for waste products, which serve as a medium for bacteria. Now the large intestine is about five feet long and it consists of the cecum, the appendix, the colon, the rectum and anal canal. The large intestine has no digestive function in itself. Critical to the operation of the gastrointestinal system is an adequate intake of fiber. Many major diseases of Western society relate to the lack of dietary fiber intake. Consider that in one year, the average American consumes 100 pounds of refined sugar, 55 pounds of fats and oils, 300 cans of soda pop, 18 pounds of sweets and candy, 5 pounds of potato crisps, seven pounds of corn chips, popcorn, pretzels, 63 dozen donuts, 50 pounds of cakes and biscuits, and 20 gallons of ice cream. Cultures that consume high fiber diets usually have a transit time through the gastrointestinal system of around 30 hours and a fecal weight in the vicinity of 500 grams. Now in contrast, Europeans and Americans who eat a typically low fiber diet, which is about 20 grams per day, they have a transit time of greater than 48 hours and a fecal weight of only 100 grams. So when the fiber is added to the diet of individuals with high rapid transit times, their transit times slow down, thus normalizing bowel movements. So the effect of fiber on transit time is related to its effect on stool weight and size. A larger, bulkier stool passes through the colon more easily. It requires less pressure to be produced during defecation and subsequently is less straining. 
Now this results in less stress on the colon wall and therefore avoids the ballooning effect which results in diverticula and it prevents the formation of hemorrhoids and varicose veins. Now the effect of dietary fiber on digestion are also noticeable. Although dietary fiber increases the rate of transit time through the gastrointestinal tract, it slows gastric emptying. This results in food being released more gradually into the small intestine, and as a result, blood glucose levels will rise more gradually. Now, dietary fiber is also of primary importance in maintaining suitable bacterial flora in the colon. A low fiber intake is associated with both an overgrowth of harmful bacteria and a lower percentage of beneficial bacteria. A high fiber diet will promote the growth of beneficial bacteria. As obesity has become an epidemic in our world, it's important to note the role of dietary fiber in preventing obesity by increasing the amount of necessary chewing, thus slowing the eating process, also improving digestive hormone secretion, improving glucose tolerance, increasing fecal calorie loss, and inducing a state of satiety. Herbalife's fiber products are an excellent supplement to your diet and will help your body realize the health benefits of having a high fiber diet, including helping you to control your weight. So now that we have a basic understanding of our gastrointestinal system and the importance of fiber in our diet, I'd like to now cover some of the conditions which can occur when we don't have an adequate intake of fiber in our diet. The main conditions are irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, collapsed colon, megacolon, inflammatory bowel disease, which includes colitis and Crohn's disease, diverticulosis, and constipation. Irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, is the most common gastrointestinal disorder reported to general practitioners. 30 to 50% of all referrals to gastroenterologists suffer from the condition. Estimates are that approximately 15% of the population have suffered from IBS and that there are twice as many women sufferers as men. IBS is a condition which is a result of food accumulating in the intestine because it's not being digested properly or there's not proper bowel movement function. As a result, the food remains in the colon and rots. This leads to toxic chemicals being formed getting absorbed into the body and beginning to poison our systems. If enough fecal matter accumulates in the colon as a result of it not being eliminated from the body, a condition known as collapsed colon may develop. This is a condition which occurs when fecal matter is not eliminated from our digestive system on a regular basis. Its weight increases until eventually the increased weight causes the intestine to collapse. In falling, pressure is exerted on the organs that normally reside on the bottom part of the abdomen, creating complications with the bladder, prostate, and for women, the uterus and other female organs. The ensuing consequences are severe. In women, a collapsed colon can lead to the formation of cysts, infertility, and several other serious conditions. In men, problems can arise with the prostate, a decrease in fertility, and a decrease in sexual desire. IBS can also give rise to a condition known as megacolon, as more and more materials accumulate in the colon as a result of IBS. Given that the colon has the ability to expand up to five times its regular size, the size of the colon can increase dramatically. Now you've seen pictures of people with very big stomachs and in comparison, very thin legs. Well, this is possibly the condition they're suffering from. In addition, the toxic substances which accumulate in our colon can contribute to becoming obese by depleting the body of energy. Now, toxins build up in the colon can slow down our body's metabolism and at the same time they slow down our cellular metabolism, overcharging the organs and the glands. This results in a slower metabolism, not burning as many calories and leading to an inevitable increase in weight. Again, merely cleansing the colon will greatly improve the metabolism and eliminate a major cause for gaining weight. Now let's talk about inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. 
The term inflammatory bowel disease refers to a large group of disorders that affect the gastrointestinal system and as the name implies, causes inflammation in the digestive system. Inflammation is a process that occurs when the body's immune system begins to fight off viruses, bacteria, or fungus, creating some chemicals which may irritate the body's own tissues, causing heat, redness, swelling, and loss of function. Now these changes are all characteristic of inflamed tissue. In ulcerative colitis, inflammation occurs in the lining of the large intestine and the rectum. In rare cases, it may extend into the small intestine. But in most cases, however, the small intestine remains normal. There is strong evidence suggesting that dietary factors are the most probable cause for this disease. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are two common forms of IBD. Ulcerative colitis occurs only in the lining of the intestine, while the damage caused by Crohn's disease can extend to all layers of the intestinal wall. The inflammation associated with ulcerative colitis can eventually cause portions of the intestinal lining to peel off, exposing open pits or ulcerations which can easily become infected. Ulcerative colitis occurs in all age groups and affects men and women equally, although the most common age of diagnosis is between 15 and 35 years of age. Another serious condition which develops as a result of not having enough fiber in your diet is diverticulosis. Diverticulosis is a condition where pockets or pouches form in the large intestine. The large intestine is a long tube-like structure that stores and eliminates waste material. During normal lower intestinal function, the waste material is slowly pushed along the large intestine to the rectum by the muscular bands in the colon. As a person ages, this continuous pressure can cause a bulging pocket of tissue or a sac called a diverticulum that pushes out from the colon wall. More than one sac is called diverticula. The condition of having diverticula in the large intestine is called diverticulosis. When a diverticulum ruptures or becomes infected, this condition is called diverticulitis. Diverticulitis develops when a mass of hardened waste matter forms in the pouch and reduces the blood supply to the thin walls of the pouch, making them susceptible to infection by the bacteria of the colon. It's estimated that 30% of all people over the age of 45 have diverticulosis. At the age of 60, 50% of all people will develop this condition. And by the age of 85, 65% of all people will have diverticulosis. Researchers believe that diverticulosis may be age-related, but most importantly, it's caused by a lack of fiber in the diet. A diet low in fiber can lead to small, hard stools that are difficult to pass and require more pressure to push them through the large intestine. Over time, these vigorous contractions in the large intestine push the inner intestinal lining outward, causing diverticula. Now the last condition we'll discuss is constipation. Constipation is an acute or chronic condition in which bowel movements occur less often than usual or consist of hard, dry stools that are painful or difficult to pass. However, constipation is a relative term with normal patterns of bowel movements varying widely from person to person. Now the colon absorbs water while forming waste products from digested food. Muscle contractions in the colon are called peristalsis. This process of peristalsis pushes the stool toward the rectum. By the time the stool reaches the rectum, it's solid because most of the water has been absorbed. However, hard, dry stools and constipation occur when too much water is absorbed by the colon from the stool, which can result from the muscles of the colon contracting too slowly. Constipation is also referred to as irregularity of bowels or lack of regular bowel movements. Constipation usually results from not getting enough exercise, not drinking enough fluids, especially water, or delays in going to the bathroom when there's an urge or from a diet that does not include an adequate amount of fiber-rich foods, such as beans, bran cereals, fruits, raw vegetables, rice, and whole grain breads. Eating too many dairy products such as milk, cheese, yogurt, and ice cream may also result in harder stools. A person with normal bowel movements should have between two or three bowel movements per day when eating two or three meals per day. 
These bowel movements should be effortless, odorless, with a set shape, and should leave you with a sense of satisfaction and cleanliness when you finish. For illustrative purposes, let's take a look at a normal colon. Note the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum. As you can see, toxic waste accumulates, causing poisons to be absorbed inside the body. This is what happens to our body when we don't evacuate regularly. We are basically carrying poison inside our bodies. The immediate effect is that not only are we carrying these toxins inside our bodies, but we're also physically carrying around more weight, leading to obesity. The symptoms of constipation include general discomfort, and if they persist, can result in medical consequences. All of the conditions that we've discussed here could have been greatly alleviated, or maybe even avoided, simply by having an adequate intake of fiber. If we're not getting an adequate amount of fiber in our diet, Herbalife provides products to supplement the fiber in our diet and help us achieve optimum gastrointestinal health. I recommend everyone to consider the 21-day AM-PM cleansing program offered by Herbalife to begin their digestive health support routine. Upon its completion, we should consider taking the herbal aloe concentrate on a daily basis and then supplement our diet by taking Herbalife's fiber products to ensure an adequate amount of fiber in the diet, thus ensuring regular bowel movements, increased satiety, and good digestive and intestinal health in general. Of course, these products should be taken in conjunction with a healthy diet composed of unrefined foods and vegetables and limiting highly refined or processed foods. Talk to your independent Herbalite distributor for further information about our digestive health products. We wish you all the best of health.